good afternoon and welcome everyone. I'm thrilled to welcome you all here this afternoon to Professor Kerry Baker's inaugural lecture as the Sylvia Dlugosh Bowman Chair of American Studies. Chaired Professor Lecture. <laughs> This professorship was established in 1987 through the generosity of Lionel R. Bowman in memory of his wife, Sylvia Dlugash Bowman, class of 1931. After leaving Smith, Sylvia went to Columbia University School for Social Work and worked as a therapist with the Child Development Center as a clinical instructor in psychiatry at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. The Bowman Family Foundation has said of their philosophy that, quote, they believed in philanthropy, not just for services or bricks and mortar, but also for advocacy for progressive social change. That seems especially appropriate today. Without Sylvia and her family's remarkable generosity and dedica dedication, we would not be here today. I am glad we are finally having the opportunity to celebrate Carrie who received this chair a couple of years ago, but whose celebration was postponed out of caution during the pandemic. Endowed professorships honor outstanding achievement in scholarship, creativity, or research, and as such, are an important way that Smith is able to recognize a faculty colleague's unusually robust contributions to one's field. I am pleased to welcome Marilyn Schuster, the Andrew W. Mellon Professor Emerita in the Humanities, Study of Women and Gender, and Provost and Dean of the Faculty Emerita, to formally introduce Professor Baker and her many contributions and achievements. Welcome home, Marilyn. I was going to introduce myself, but this is much better. <laughs> so it's a very special pleasure to introduce Carrie Baker this afternoon. She's a compelling model of an engaged scholar who makes a difference. After graduating from Yale with a degree in philosophy, Carrie earned a JD at Emory University in 1994, where she was editor-in-chief of the Law Journal. Seven years later, she received a PhD in the interdisciplinary field of women's studies, also at Emory. I first met Carrie when she interviewed successfully for a two-year visiting position in the study of women and gender here at Smith in 2007. She answered questions about her teaching and administrative responsibilities at Barry College in Georgia, where she was an assistant professor in anthropology and sociology with a, oops, with a six course teaching load. She also served often simultaneously as chair of her department, director of women's studies, coordinator of interdisciplinary studies, and co-director of the Southern Women Writers Conference. She proceeded to give <clears throat> a dazzling presentation based on her book manuscript on sexual harassment, a book that she was writing without benefit of a sabbatical. So uh, uh, after her presentation, I asked her jokingly what else she did with her time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a photographer, she said. <laughs> and now three of her photos hang in our living room. After she returned to Barry, she was promoted to associate professor with tenure. She applied for a tenure track job at Smith in 2011, and she was by far the most accomplished candidate and was willing to return to Smith even without the tenure she had earned in the interim. Students and colleagues welcomed her and her family, her husband Harvey, and her two then young sons back to Northampton. She has not slowed down one whit in her teaching, research, and activist work since then. On the contrary, I'm exhausted just hearing about her public writing. 
her articles for Ms. Magazine, her op-eds, and now her radio talk show at WHMP, the very same radio station where Rachel Maddow got her start. <laughs> Think about it. But in addition, she's a serious athlete, and she has learned welding and basket weaving. And last Saturday, she did the Berkshire Highlands Pentathon, which includes a run, bike, kayak, obstacle course, and ski, after hiking up the mountain. <laughs> it took her a mere four hours. And by the way, she's still a photographer. <laughs> Kara's first two books, published by Cambridge, The Women's Movement Against Sexual Harassment, 2008, and Fighting the U.S. Youth Sex Trade, Gender, Race, and Politics in 2018, <clears throat> each take an urgent contemporary issue and explore its historical, legal, and political antecedents from new perspectives, using her skills as a legal scholar and applying interdisciplinary methods. Her book on sexual harassment in the US focused on case law, the significant cases brought primarily by working class women of color who had experienced harassment by their employers. The case law history Carrie examines complements and complicates the history of uh, sexual harassment law. The dominant, uh, the dominant narrative at that point was a legislative history centering on white women professionals. The stories that Carrie tells of the courage, persistence, struggles, and sacrifices by women who put their jobs on the line in the courts greatly enrich our understanding <clears throat> of a complex social movement. In her second book, Carrie focuses on youth sex trafficking. That's hard to say fast, you know. In the US at a time when there was a tendency here to assume that sex trafficking happened somewhere else. Carrie examines the factors that have facilitated sex trafficking, <coughs> trafficking from the mid 20th century to the present. And she exposes the twisted contradictions in the law that produced this paradox described by a member of the, of the Dallas Police Department. Quote, if a 45-year-old man had sex with a 14-year-old girl and no money exchanged hands, she was likely to get counseling and he was likely to get jail time for statutory rape. If the same man left $80 on the table after having sex with her, she would probably be jailed for prostitution, and he would probably go home with a fine. Carrie interviewed dozens of <coughs> activists involved in the movement, and as she says, there emerged an ideological diverse social movement composed of survivors and social service providers, feminists and evangelical Christians, sex worker advocates and human rights act activists, politicians, professionals, and celebrities. In her current book, Abortion Pills, U.S. History and Politics, Carrie takes an increasingly urgent contemporary problem, growing restrictions on reproductive rights uh, after the Dobbs decision took away the constitutional right to abortion established by Roe nearly 50 years ago. She draws on legal, medical, and political archives and look at looks at the effects of the tangle of anti-abortion laws emerging in different states. She discusses the history of FDA approval of mefepristone and the emergence of telemedicine and sending drugs, dist distributing of drugs by mail. She interviews dozens of activists coming from divergent backgrounds, and she ultimately argues that reproductive restrictions are, quite simply, a deadly form of coercion. In an age when many academics claim to be public intellectuals, Carrie has more than earned that title. She puts scholarship to work in an effort to make a real difference on issues that affect all of us. Carrie connects with many kinds of audiences, whether writing scholarly books, online essays, op-eds for newspapers, interviewing people on the radio, or appearing recently on MSNBC. Her work is lively, well-researched, balanced, and engaging. I'm honored to welcome my dear friend and former colleague, 
the newest occupant of the Sylvia Dwebu, I can't say it. <laughs> <laughs> the Sylvia Bauman chair. <laughs> uh, Carrie Ann Baker, her offer is resisting reproductive coercion, abortion pills, post-ops. I have one postscript. Yesterday, she showed me this book, recently published, and she was careful to say that she hadn't actually written it, it's, <laughs> but she was the force behind it. And it's a comprehensive history of her great-grandmother, who was a wonderful woman architect uh, in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania primarily, who designed buildings in the late 19th and early century. So, Carrie. I invited all my favorite people, and so many of you are here. I love it. I love it. Um, thank you, President Sarah, and thank you so much, Marilyn, for those wonderful introductions. And I'm, I'm thrilled to be here today. So um, today I want to talk about my forthcoming book. Tell me if this is like echoing, um, on the history and politics of abortion pills in the United States. This book originated in my public writing and activism. So these are some of the places where I've published, and, and I want to give you some background to that. In 2010, after I got tenure the first time at Berry College, I gave myself a present of doing a public writing workshop with Ms. Magazine. And I have since published almost 400 articles with Ms. on a wide range of topics relating to women's rights. And recently, I've really drilled down and focused on this issue of abortion pills. And this book grew out of that reporting. I became a Ms. Magazine contributing editor in 2020 and co-chair of the Ms. Committee of Scholars, which recruits and trains feminist faculty from across the country to write for the media, for the public. I have a column, as Susan, as Marilyn mentioned, um, in the Daily Hampshire Gazette, and recently started the radio show called Feminist Futures um, with WHMP here in town. Um, and um, again, I, I regularly speak to the media about women's legal rights related issues. This public writing and speaking has fed my scholarship and vice versa. My scholarship has fed Hey, Julie, sorry, uh, has fed my, my um, public writing as well. And um, both have enhanced my teaching. Um, and I just look around the room and so many students that are here have edited my manuscripts, edited my pieces. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at you, four of them right there and others over here. Julie and I did a, 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 an early medication abortion piece that's right up here. Um, Julie is a graduate student over at UMass and, and so, yeah, you already graduated. Right, right, right. And worked for Lindsay Sabadosa. Yeah. And then we worked on legislation together. So I'll get to that. And um, f so I just want to thank all of that and the synergies that were created between the scholarship and the public writing and my teaching have been so productive and so joyous and so exciting for me here at Smith College. So I want to just quickly go through and talk about the ways in which um, these synergies have happened. So this piece um, was my very first piece in Ms. Magazine. It was the summer of 2010. It was called Jailing Girls for Men's Crimes. Um, kind of like what Marilyn explained, right? If, if it's prostitution, then it's the girls are the criminals and the guys are just, you know, having fun. And that, I interviewed a bunch of activists across the country and got really curious about that movement. And that led to the book on the right, which was my, my, my full professor book, um, Fighting the U.S. Youth Sex Trade. So I had made these contacts. I had sort of a bird's eye view of the movement, but I wanted to dig down and understand the movement better. So I did the scholarship, and that, that, so that's how my public writing led to a book. But it works the other way around, right? My first book has led to a lot of public writing on sexual harassment. This is um, a recent, well, not recent, summer 2018, so not recent. Um, enough is enough. It was when Me Too exploded, and and Ms. was looking for you know, people that understood sexual harassment to cover what was happening, both the movement but also the legal developments. And so I wrote tons of articles for Ms. And I also worked in the upper right-hand corner through the Scholar Strategy Network, a, um, 
Massachusetts um, Boston based organization that connects scholars to um, legislators and to the media to try to move beyond and engage in the community. So I've worked with them a lot over the years. Um, so my recent project, it, it was like um, it grew out of my public writing. So here's a couple recent articles um, that I've written in 22 and 24 about abortion pills. And that is the book that's forthcoming in December 3rd. And I have a full copy of it up here if you want to like look at the table of contents. But um, it is a, a history, as it said, a US history of, uh, of abortion pills and, and talking about the politics of abortion pills. And I'll explain a little bit in more detail how it came about and what inspired me to write the book. So, um, okay. Um, and I just want to stop here and say quickly, I, I believe that reproductive rights and bodily autonomy are central to women's rights and therefore to human rights generally. And I believe that abortion pills are at the center of the battle for reproductive rights. And I, I hope to convince you of that today. Um, and so first I wanna do some level setting because you may not know what abortion pills are. This is my education hat getting turning on. So there are two ways to have an abortion. One is procedural. You know, you put your feet in stirrups and you know, that happens. And the other is medications. Medication abortion is done with two pills, mifepristone, which blocks the pregnancy sustaining hormone progesterone. And 24 hours later, you take four misoprostol, which is a common ulcer medication. And what misoprostol does is it causes contractions to expel the contents of the uterus. The FDA approved mifepristone in 2000, which, and, um, which, and today they advise these medications through 10 weeks of pregnancy, although they're, they're effective later in pregnancy and many doctors use them through 13 weeks. So, the, and, and by the way, Danko makes the brand name Mifepristone. Gen Biopro makes the generic. That was approved in 2019. And um, that's what it looks like, the round pill and the six-sided pills. Okay, so the safety and effectiveness. The combination of Mifepristone and Misoprostol pills is over 99% effective and is an extremely safe way to end an early pregnancy. Abortion pills are easy to use and safer than Tylenol. The New York Times has compiled over 100 peer-reviewed research studies showing the effectiveness and safety of medication abortion. Um, but they're still highly restricted. They should be over the counter, but they're still highly restricted and that's because of abortion politics. I'll explain more in a minute. So um, how common are, is medication abortion? Abortion pills are an increase, increasingly common way to end an unwanted pregnancy. In the last six years, their use has grown from less than 39% to 63% of abortions today. And it's probably higher, but it's, it's very common. And there's reasons why the um, use has increased. In 2000, when the FDA originally approved mifepristone, um, they only allowed the medication to be administered in person by a doctor in a medical clinic, and you had to go to three appointments, and you could only use it for seven weeks. That was one way in which it was highly restricted, and in part because of anti-abortion pressure. In 2016, under the Obama administration, the FDA removed some of these restrictions, allowing a wider range of providers to dispense the medication and expanding the limit till 10 weeks. Then in 2021, due to COVID, the FDA began um, allowing clinicians to prescribe abortion pills by telemedicine, which means, as you know, clinicians meet remotely with patients, screen them, and then mail the pills to them. This was groundbreaking. This greatly increased access. The FDA also began for the first time ever to allow pharmacies to dispense mifepristone. Okay, so that's the level setting. Now that we've defined some of these key terms, I want to explain the origins of this project. And we're gonna go back to 2018, or even before that. So I've taught reproductive rights in my gender and law law and policy class for over 20 years. In 2011, when I came to Smith, I developed a reproductive justice course. And in 2013, worked with a group of folks in the Valley to create a five college certificate in reproductive health rights and justice. The current director is sitting on the back row over there, Jennifer Nye, a professor of history at UMass. In 2016, 
I joined the board of the Abortion Rights Fund of Western Massachusetts, later becoming the president of that in 2021. They raise money and help people pay for abortions. When Trump became president in 2016 and began filling the Supreme Court with conservative anti-abortion judges, I knew that Roe v. Wade would soon be overturned. I'd been studying this long enough to know this was gonna happen. I began to explore how the movement was preparing to help women and people obtain abortion when states would ban healthcare clinicians from providing this care. And I found um, an activist in Boston. Her name was Susan Yanel, and she worked with a group called um, SAS, um, Self-Managed Abortion Safe and Supported. It was part of an international group called Women Help Women. In 2018, one of my students, Emily Belanca, and I wrote a Ms. Magazine article called DIY Abortion. It was an interview with Susan, and it was talking about the beginning of this, and it wasn't the beginning, but they were, it was, she was talking about this underground abortion pill movement that was anticipating the fall of Roe. Um, but even before Roe, it, abortion was so inaccessible in so many places, and so it was serving the people that didn't have access otherwise. Later, I brought Susan to Smith to do a community training on how to share information about how people are using abortion pills outside of the healthcare system, um, which is called self-managed abortion. And I know there's some people, Susan Faludi came to that, and maybe some others in the room. I don't know if Jennifer, you were there. But so we were learning about how were people sharing this information, you know, without practicing medicine, without a license. So there was, you know, we relied on the First Amendment, and we talked indirectly. So, so I began to cover um, extensively the abortion pill, abortion pills generally, but this underground abortion pill movement for Ms. Magazine. Um, and um, I did this more and more. Um, activists um, worked to increase abortion pill access within the healthcare system, and so I covered that. At the time, the FDA, as I said, required clinicians to administer in person, but when the pandemic hit, Activists challenged this restriction in federal court, saying you're exposing people to dangers by requiring them to go in person. They filed a case in Maryland. They won it in July of 2020. And for the first time, doctors began to be able to mail abortion pills. And virtual abortion clinics, as I called them in my reporting, began to um, provide these pills. But, of course, Trump was in office, and it didn't last for long. He challenged the decision um, to allow telemedicine abortion all the way to the Supreme Court twice. And in January of 2021, SCOTUS reversed. Now, wait a minute. Trump had lost the election. Biden was about to come in. The Biden administration came into office, and he quickly directed the FDA to reconsider the restriction, which they did. And in April, the FDA began allowing telemedicine abortion for the duration of the pandemic. Then Biden said, and why don't you review it to permanently remove that restriction? So these virtual clinics exploded all over the country. Um, and these were some of the very early clinics. And you know they were often out of people's basements, but they began to serve a significant number of people. And what was great is where the anti-abortion movement had sort of kept abortion to abortion clinics and then surrounded abortion clinics with protesters and you know sort of attacked that and now all of a sudden they couldn't do that this was a really revolutionary avenue for expanded access to abortion so um Virtual clinics, I began profiling new virtual abortion clinics in Ms. and spreading the word about this new service. Abortion on Demand was the first one that I did, um, and they were providing about 20 states at the time. This was in um, uh, June of 2021. But then I did a 13-part series of interviews with the owners of all these new abortion clinics. And it was so interesting because like nobody knew what this was, what it looked like. They didn't even know. Like they were reading each other's profiles and, and it was legitimizing this form of care. And it was introducing potential clients to these people. Now, I have to give these people credit because they were also putting their names out there 
you know, but they didn't have addresses. There wasn't like a street address. And so, but you know, it still took a lot of courage, but it was so thrilling to interview all these um, providers, these clinicians um, from all over the country that were providing this revolutionary new service. It was so exciting. Um, and so, um, and this became, by the way, an invaluable source for my book because I was getting on the ground, real time, reporting on what was happening, how telemedicine abortion was becoming a thing. And we, at the time, we didn't even know if it would remain a thing, right? Um, but it has, and it's been, I'll tell you later, incredibly important to maintaining abortion access post Dobbs. So um, I also interviewed, and this was really fun, a bunch of like researchers at places like University of California, San Francisco, and University of Texas. These are three of them, Ushma, Dan, and, and Abigail. I got to know them very well. And whenever they'd come out with a new study, I'd call them up and say, oh, can I interview you about it? And it was all about how this new service was safe, and people liked it. It was accessible. It was easy to use. And, um, and so I think this was really important, again, to reassure people that not only are abortion pills safe, but telemedicine is safe. And there's really top-notch researchers who are showing this. Again, this became really important when I wrote the book because I really understood the science behind the medicine, and that is a large part of the book. So in September of 2021, if you remember, Texas banned abortion at six weeks using the sort of vigilante enforcement mechanism, and I don't want to get into that, but they, they banned abortion. And um, then in December of 2021, the FDA permanently lifted the in-person dispensing requirement. So we have things going in different directions, right? You know, Texas clamping down, six weeks, the FDA saying, oh, no, now everybody can get telemedicine abortion. This is all really important. Again, continued to report. These, the line of articles, that's all my reporting. Um, and so... Um, Lot, very exciting time, lots happening. Meanwhile, you know what happened. You know what happened, right? In 2016, the court was evenly balanced between liberals and conservatives, but Trump got into office. By 2021, it had tilted to the right. And this was a very, he pointed three people, it was a very, very anti-abortion um, conservative court. And in that year, 19 states enacted a broad range of restrictions, including bans, teeing up a case to go up to the court to reverse Roe versus Wade, which is, of course, what happened. So, um, so I knew that this was, um, everybody knew that um, Roe was over, and the movement was preparing by developing an underground pill network, and so I began covering it. And that was a little trickier to get people to interview, and it, it, but it was interesting. I mean, I had to use a lot of creative ways, and I had to build trust. I had to build trust so that people could recommend me to other people. And, and I didn't, sometimes I couldn't reveal who my sources were. I would do the reporting anonymously. Um, again, I use this in my book. Very helpful for the book. So, um, and again, more coverage, preparing for Dobbs. I began intensely covering the development of creative ways that people in restrictive states were obtaining abortion pills, um, either through the medical system, using telemedicine from states where it was legal, and using things like mail forwarding, or using international telemedicine providers, or um, ordering pills online. There were a bunch of new websites selling pills online, but like, you know, is that safe? What's the story with that? So I was doing a lot of that reporting. So this is the point at which um, self-managed abortion began to really emerge. So self-managed abortion means accessing abortion outside of the medical system. Um, it's often done by obtaining abortion pills and taking them independently of the formal healthcare system. So not going to your doctor, but getting them somewhere else and then maybe finding a hotline that can kind of talk you through it or finding resources online. A number of organizations formed to provide people with accurate information and support to self-manage their abortions. This has been going on around the world. Um, and we were this movement here was often informed, for instance, by, by women in Latin America and in other countries around the world. We were bringing that information, like Susan Yanow works very closely around the world. They were bringing that knowledge into the US to try to prepare the US for the post-Dobbs world. 
So these organizations include Plan C, which told people where to find abortion pills. And you got a little sticker on your seat from Plan C. I'll talk more about them in a minute. The m and hotline, that's Miscarriage and Abortion Hotline, which is a confidential 24-hour uh, hotline where you can call and talk to doctors and nurses um, by text, by phone, um, in other ways. Um, and so they were supporting people, uh, giving medical support to people who were getting the pills on their own. Um, Repro Care Health Line provided free, confidential, emotional, and logistical support for using, for self-managing abortion. And Repro Legal Help Line, which provided free, confidential, legal support. Um, and I, oh, also SAS, which was Susan's organization, was providing information. So let me talk a little bit about Plan C. It's a public health campaign started in 2015 by a small team of public health advocates, researchers, and social justice activists, and digital strategists, whose goal was to transform access to abortion in the US by normalizing the self-directed option of abortion pills by mail. Their goal is, is, in the near future, in which the ability to end an early pregnancy is directly in the hands of anybody who needs it. Plan C maintains a website that explains avenues for abortion pill access, including telemedicine abortion through the formal healthcare system and alternative avenues for people living in restrictive states, such as telemedicine abortion from abroad or using mail forwarding, as I mentioned, or community support networks that are distributing free pills underground, or reliable websites selling pills. So this is their drop-down menu. You go to that box, that's the URL, and you select your state. Let's say you're in Texas. They'll tell you exactly how to get abortion pills. They'll tell you the legality. They'll tell you the safe, vetted providers. So websites selling pills, how do you vet that? Well, I am one of their researchers. So if you look up here on the table, there's all these little like USPS boxes with little boxes of abortion pills. So these are those. And um, Plan C gets researchers like me to order from these websites. We track all the data, like what kind of forms of payment do they take? How long does it take? Were they nice to me? Did they communicate accurately? How long did it take to get the pills? And then I send the pills to them. They take them to a lab, test them, and then if they're reliable, they put it on a list of vetted websites. And they say how expensive it is and how long it takes. And so it's a way for people not to just go out there and order on any random site. They don't know if they want to give their credit card. They'll, OK, these are good sites. We can rely on them. I have interviewed some of the owners of these sites. They, they are abroad. They are doing completely illegal things. But of course, when there is a need, there is a market. It may be an underground market, but there is a market, and that's who these folks are. They mail pills in bulk into the United States, and they have distribution centers all over. Somebody orders it, they pop it in the mail, and um, I'll talk a little bit. At the time I was doing a lot of this research, it cost you know two to three hundred dollars, uh, sometimes more. Today, because of the with Plancy's website, they list them in order of cost. You can now get them for like forty-five dollars arriving in a couple days, you know, free market. So, um, so anyway, um, so that, that's a little bit of fun research in the movement, um, but really helpful to me to understand how these things work because I talk about them in my book. So um, I'll just briefly say I interviewed people that use abortion pills, particularly in states where it's been banned, and I did a story on a young woman in Texas. This was after SB8, but before Dobbs, and she needed pills, and she ended up using a telemedicine provider in Michigan who mailed the pills through uh, Colorado, where she was licensed. The woman got a, um, you know, one of those anytime mailboxes and gave that as her address and then had the pills forwarded to Houston, where she was living, and was able to get an abortion. And I did that story in, um, in April, and then in the summer, the New York Times called and said, will you tell us who that person is? And of course, I had to make sure, I mean, I had to check in with the person and make sure she had lots of legal support, because I had done it anonymously for her. But I put her in touch with the New York Times opinion video team, and they created this eight-minute video, which went up days after 
Dobbs. It was called This is What a Post-Roe Abortion Looks Like. So Texas was sort of a testing ground for what was it gonna be like post-Roe for people to access pills. And she got them and she got her abortion and she was so brave to do this. It's a very powerful video. I, I recommend that you watch it if, if you're interested. So Dobbs happened, right? In June of 2024, the Supreme Court um, reversed Roe versus Wade. And as of today, and this is the New York Times map that's updated regularly, 14 states ban abortion totally, two states ban it at six weeks, which is pretty much totally, and several more ban at 12 to 18 weeks. If you follow the news earlier this week, Florida's six-week ban was approved by their court and will go into place soon, and Arizona's 1864 ban, zombie law, was put back into place, so 16 states ban abortion um, or more. So, um, you know, that's where we are today. So right after Dobbs, um, Massachusetts, and I may have had something to do with this, um, passed a law protecting abortion providers from criminal and civil liability for serving people in, in banned states, meaning if somebody travels from Texas to Massachusetts, you're protected. This, these kinds of laws passed in a lot of progressive states, but Massachusetts law was different because of five words, and those five words were, regardless of where the patient lives, which meant that telemedicine abortion was covered, which meant doctors and clinicians in Massachusetts could have a patient in Texas and mail the pills to them. In other words, the, the care was being defined as where the provider was located rather than where the patient was located. This is really revolutionary and will be challenged by the antis. They haven't done it yet, but they will. But um, shortly after that, two groups formed the Abortion Coalition for Telemedicine and Healthcare Across Borders that, to push for more of these kinds of laws. Other states have passed similar laws, including Washington, Colorado, Vermont, New York, and California. And because of these laws, a number of shield state telemedicine abortion providers have formed Aid Access, Abuzz, and The Map, which is based in Cambridge. And they are providing up to 12,000 abortions a month to people in states with bans. This is within the medical system. This is with you know, providers that are giving them, you know, just like if you did it with your own provider here in the state. This is really revolutionary. And this is one reason why, and I'm gonna show you the numbers, abortion's not dropped post-Roe, I mean post-Dobbs, it's gone up. So, um, and, and because there's more access. So, um, so it's just so interesting how this has worked. So starting in, um, okay. Okay, so I talked about that. So this is the origin of the book, by the way. So I'm just like reporting away, I'm reporting away, but then they pissed me off, okay? <laughs> Let me go back. So um, this random group of anti-abortion doctors and a dentist <laughs> filed a lawsuit in Amarillo, Texas. Why did they choose Amarillo? There's one judge. That one judge is a Trump appointee, virulently anti-abortion. And they knew they'd get him. So that's called form shopping in the law. They filed this lawsuit um, trying to pull Mifepristone from the market. And they made um, a lot of really irritating, um, irritating arguments. Like, they argued that the FDA sped through approval of mifepristone without science showing that the medication was safe. They argued that the FDA expanded access in 2016 and 2021 without adequate science to support the safety of the medication. They argued that mifepristone's not safe, it's dangerous. They said that the FDA's 2021 decision to allow clinicians to mail abortion pills violates the Comstock Act an 1873 anti-obscenity law. Talk about a zombie law. And these anti-abortion doctors and dentists, they claimed, had standing to sue because they may have to someday treat someone who may have used abortion pills. And that was an aesthetic injury to them. They actually said that. This pissed me off. And this is what inspired my book. The book. Because I was like, 
I want an accurate historical record about how this is just a bunch of lies. The scientific claims are lies, the historical claims are lies, I mean just lies, 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 lies. So I decided to write this book. So this was filed in November of 2022, and I happened to have a sabbatical in, in the spring of 23. And so I buckled down and I wrote this in about six months. Wow. And in part, I, I was able to do it because I had been reporting for six years. Like I knew this inside and out. I talked to so many people. And so I, and I had all my reporting. And so like I cranked this thing out. So, um, so, I wanted to provide an accurate history. I wanted to correct the mis and disinformation about the FDA approval process for Mifepristone in 2000, and to correct mis and disinformation about the safety of abortion pills, and to tell, and this is really important, to tell the decades long feminist campaign to make abortion pills accessible. It was a fight, and, and I, you know, I love that. I love tracking the movement. All my books are about the movement. So my research, I did archival research, love that. I did legal research, yeah, I do that all the time. I did medical research. I interviewed over 80 activists, researchers, clinicians, policymakers, and women who've used abortion pills. I tracked down somebody at the company that developed the pill back in the 1980s, the, the one woman who was like fighting to increase access. And all the guys were like, oh, it's not really all that important. But she's like, yes, do it, do it, do it. She was great. She's French. And also I researched, um, I don't, that was sort of a non sequitur um, the media coverage as well, which was really fascinating. Like this 1991, you know, the pill that changes everything. It hasn't changed, it's changing everything, but just like 30 years later because of the power of the anti-abortion movement. So just to tell you about some of my findings, um, the FDA approval of mif mifepristone was not rushed. In fact, it was excruciatingly slow, taking 20 years from when the medication was developed in France in 1980 to when the FDA approved the pill in, 20, in 2000. Despite a strong safety record, as I mentioned, the FDA tightly restricted mifepristone, placing unusual and medically unnecessary restrictions on the medication. The, as I mentioned before, the FDA blocked pharmacies from dispensing the medication and required doctors, they would only allow doctors to do it. They had to register with a drug manufacturer and get on a list. They had to stock the medication themselves and dispense the drug in person over three appointments. As a result, only abortion clinics offered the medication and that's what the aunties wanted because they put a target on abortion clinics. They wanna know where it's happening and to be able to target that. A long-standing and persistent campaign by activists, lawmakers, researchers, and clinicians slowly expanded access to abortion pills. And that's, I tell that story in the book. Today, as I've said, or implied, abortion pills are revolutionizing abortion health care in the US. And these decades of activism is, are to thank these activists. The book celebrates the courageous people who have fought hard for increased access to abortion pills. So I um, initially published an article in the Journal of um, Health, Politics, Policy, and Law in August of 2023. This was sort of like a preview of what's coming, and it's up here on the table if you'd like to see it. Um, I also have done a ton of media work, um, as you know, Marilyn said most recently on MSNBC, talk about a fish out of water. But, uh, but at the end, Alex Wagner leaned over and she said, when your book comes out, let me know and I'll have you back on to talk about it. I mean, I was a lawyer. I'm like, okay, here's the contract. Please sign. <laughs> so, um, so I've been speaking to the media a ton. I was on Dahlia Lithwick right before the oral arguments in the abortion pill case. So the, the abortion pill case is now before the Supreme Court. The lower courts, which were very conservative, um, basically allowed restrictions. So it's now on appeal. And so um, I've been doing a lot of media work. And by the way, I'm supported in my re media work by a media training with a women's um, Media Center, um, founded by Gloria Steinem, as well as Jane Fonda and Robin Morgan. They do a progressive women's voices training. So they train you about how to do television and radio. Um, so that's kind of helpful. Not that I'm any good at it, but um, there's that. Um, I also, um, this book has also been informed by um, policy work that I've done. So Julia, who's now gone, and I um, did research on two barriers that college students have in Massachusetts to accessing 
um, abortion, medication abortion in particular. And we published this piece in the public health journal Contraception. And um, I did an academic minute on it. That was really fun. It, really hard to get a whole article down into a minute. And, um, and then um, I testified before the Massachusetts legislature. And in um, Lindsay Sabadosa sponsored the legislation. And by the way, up here I have her, um, her nomination form for her reelection. So if you live in Northampton, please come and sign it. Because you know you have to be nominated even if you're just running again. So um, I'm collecting signatures for her. She's Amazing. She's our representative here in Northampton. In um, July of 2022, she, um, the legislature passed the law. And so now, if you go to a public university in Massachusetts, you can just go to the health clinic to get abortion pills. And before this law, no public university in Massachusetts provided that service, um, in part because of how stigmatized abortion pills are. They thought it was difficult or scary, but now they have to do it. So that was really exciting. And in October, I spoke on the NPR marketplace. That was really fun. I had like relatives from all over saying, I think I just heard you on Marketplace. And, um, and so we're trying to get these kinds of laws passed in other, country, in other um, states um, to, again, increase access to abortion pills. Um, ongoing coverage, continuing to cover it, um, you know, the self-managed movement, um, following the rise of self-managed, the advent of pharmacy dispensing of abortion pills, and the growing underground abortion pill movement in the United States. Um, these are some of the websites where you can order pills. As I said, after Dobbs, pl prices plummeted from hundreds of dollars to as little as $42 a day with two-day delivery um, as demand and competition skyrocketed. Um, and you can get advanced provision pills for 25 bucks. And again, all these sites are vetted. Um, in addition, um, these underground community networks have expanded significantly. So these are um, grassroots activists that are pissed as hell, and they're importing large amounts of abortion pills and distributing them for free to people um, that need abortion pills. And um, for the first time, some, uh, by the way, one of my former gender law and policy students, after they graduated, just published this article on this underground network. I just love this. She went and worked for these groups and like did participant observations. She was out at Berkeley getting a master's and she just published a piece. And I actually interviewed her for my book. <laughs> Because I'm like, you know, oh, she knows, she's been there. She knows what's going on. So um, again, teaching, it's connected to my teaching. So, um, so uh, this is a map of the different groups and where they're functioning. Every state that bans abortion has a community network offering free abortion pills. And you can find out about it in lots of ways, but go to Plan C's website, that's the best way. So, and this is like really a strange turn. The Unitarian Church of Amherst, yeah, I gave a sermon, I gave a sermon. <laughs> they invited me to come speak. They had seen me somewhere. I speak, I do a lot of public speaking on this, and um, I don't, yeah, are you security back there? No, wait, is there security, is there any police here? Usually there's police, um, but I don't think there is today. How, how refreshing. But anyway, so I was, um, they invited me, and so I decided, I'm in this movement, in this underground movement, and I decided I wanted to give a moral justification for why it was right. And I did this after hearing Erin Pineda's lecture in this room, where she talked about Martin Luther King's letter from the Birmingham jail and how he justified civil disobedience, and I thought, oh my God, this is totally applicable to abortion and the underground abortion pill movement. And he, you know, he talked about unjust laws and you know, not being morally obligated. And if laws hurt people, you can violate the law. And so I did the sermon, and it's online, you can find it. But I'm trying to get it published in like Christian Century or something. I haven't been able to get anybody to do it yet. But I, I'm, I will. I'll find a way. If worse comes to worse, I'll publish it on Ms. That's when, when everybody else rejects me, Ms. will always publish it. But um, anyway, so this was a real like detour, but really fun to do. So I'm, I promise I'm, I'm getting towards the end. Um, what has been the impact of all this activism? Well, as I mentioned, there was this really surprising report that came out recently that the numbers of abortion have increased since Dobbs significantly, despite the significant state restrictions. In 2023, there were over 1 million abortions, and that's the highest it's been since 2012. 
And you can see the dip. And the dip was because of all the restrictions without the, these alternatives. And then once we were pushed to develop these alternatives, now it's starting to go back. So it was, I think it's gonna have been worse right before Dobbs as far as lack of access. And it's, I think it's going to only get more accessible with time. Um, and this is um, largely or in part fueled by telemedicine abortion, which I just explained to you. And these numbers, by the way, do not include any of the underground. This is only through the medical system. Met member medication abortion rose to 63% of all abortions in 2023, and 16% of those were done by telemedicine, up from basically zero in 2020. So I think that's a lot of why we're seeing this. And these numbers do not include abortion outside the medical system. So um, there was, though, just a week or two ago in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, a, the first study to attempt to quantify the number of abortions done outside of the medical system in the United States. And it showed that in the six months after Dobbs, there were approximately 32,000 fewer abortions in the formal medical system, but there were 26,000 abortions in this underground system. Very interesting. And I don't think this caught at all, but, um, and what were the sources? Half were community networks, 37% were telemedicine organizations, and 11% were online vendors. So it'll be interesting to see how this develops over time. And the fight goes on. So anti-abortion folks are trying to, um, they have pledged through Project 2025, if you've heard of that, that the next Republican president will pull the FDA approval of Mifepristone and enforce the Comstock Act to prohibit mailing any kind of abortion pills. By the way, you can use misoprostol alone for abortion. I think that, you know, they will try to ban all of that. Um, also, the antis are, the states are um, doing increasing surveillance and may try to criminalize self-managed abortion. It's not criminal now. The criminal laws against abortion are directed at doctors, not at people that use abortion pills. But the concern is that might turn around. Um, some states are trying to outlaw websites saying how people are obtaining pills, a clear violation of the First Amendment. This was North Carolina. Um, and abortion opponents may challenge these provider shield laws that are allowing like aid access to do this mailing pills um, through the formal system. On the other hand, in abortion protective states, more states may pass healthcare provider shield laws that cover telemedicine to protect clinicians who are doing this, this work. More clinicians are offering telemedicine abortion to people in banned states, so people are coming online every day. Telemedicine providers are offering advanced provision pills, so if you just wanna have it in your cabinet, and get them in advance. And by the way, one thing I didn't mention, but I wanna mention, if you go to a clinic and get pills in Massachusetts, it costs $700. If you use a telemedicine provider, it's $150 sliding scale. And there's special abortion funds that fund these. So it's not only creating access in the sense that you don't have to travel hundreds of miles to a clinic, but there's more economic access. And this is one reason also why the numbers are going up, because it's more affordable. Finally, legislatures are passing laws to protect digital privacy and medical records. And that's a big thing as well, which I don't have time to get into. So um, there's a film called Plan C about the organization Plan C. I, was, I consulted, and I have a little cameo in it. And um, I, I went to Sundance when it was, this was during my sabbatical. It was so fun. In Park City, I'm a skier. Oh, it was so fun. And um, this is all of us up on the stage when we, you know, after the screening. Um, the woman with the mic is one of the founders of Plan C. Um, so um, there's a pink flyer up here. I'm screening Plan C a week from tonight at 7 p.m. in Sealy 201. And... Francine Coito is going to be there. She's the other co-founder of Plan C. She is just like blow your mind activist. She is really the heart of the underground abortion pill movement in the United States. If you want to hear directly from her, she will be here next Thursday and we'll screen the film. And this was a blast um, going to Sundance. I'd never done it. Um, so there's that. So that's the screening. And there's flyers up here. Please post and tell your friends. Um, okay, so... That's this project. I want to tell you what my next project may be. 
because I can't help giving you a preview. So now my big thing is crisis pregnancy centers. These are like fake anti-abortion clinics. They, they, they pretend to be abortion clinics, but they're fake, and they try to lure people in. They sort of locate near abortion clinics, and they try to deceive them. I did a New York Times guest essay, my only ever, and probably my last, because they were so hard to work with. Um, this was right before Dobbs, and um, it's about crisis pregnancy centers. And I worked with a friend of mine. Um, oh, yeah, I've been writing a lot, lots of articles. Um, it's a fascinating topic. And a friend of mine, a local friend, created a group called the Abortion Truth Campaign to expose crisis pregnancy centers. Um, we've organized protests out in front of them to sort of expose them. And um, I got to be on GBH. Uh, a, opposite a director of one of these CPCs. That was interesting. And um, so this is my kind of new area that maybe will be my new book, because again, I think people don't understand what these things are. And I think that they are um, truly problematic and um, tracking pregnant people so that they can turn them into the police or you know, criminalize them. So I, I think this is a really important post row. Um, this, is, this is the underground front line of the anti-abortion movement that people don't know about. Devastatingly effective. I have a lot to say, but I won't. So, um, so just to kind of um, summarize, I my dear student, where is Max? Max created this wonderful infographic. Thank you, Max. Um, and um, to represent how I see scholarship, public writing, public speaking, policy work, and teaching all synergistically reinforcing each other in really productive and exciting ways. And the best of, thing of all is it's super fun. It's super fun. It, it just makes it real. I'm, I'm constantly bringing my articles into class. I mean, today in my seminar, and Max is in my seminar, I played that GBH CPC interview, you know, which was just like, absurd. And, um, and then we got to like, you know, deconstruct it. And, uh, you know, they're, they're doing, they're helping me with my public writing and they're doing their own public writing. I mean, Max has published, and, and, and all three of you have published, um, you know, Emmeline and, and yours a fourth. And, uh, oh yeah, yeah, Kiara, yeah, have been publishing with Ms. and, and doing work. And, um, and so anyway, that's, that's pretty much it. So I, I, in closing, I just want to say there's stickers on your seat for Plan C, but there's also stickers up here. As, and if you want to come and look at what abortion pills look like, I also have um, four or five Ms. magazines with articles about abortion pills that I wrote, if you want to just sort of see the articles, um, as well as that um, Journal of Health Policy article, the manuscript, and the contr contraception article. And um, this is what abortion pills look like, by the way. Misoprostol, mifepristone. Um, I ordered them just to have them, you know, as research. So feel free, don't take them, please. But, you're, but you can come up, you can open and feel them and look at them if you're, if you're interested. So thank you so much. So we have two minutes for Q&A. <laughs> My students are used to five minutes for Q&A. Any questions? Yeah, Gina. Yeah, because okay. Plan C talks about, you know, the in-clinic options as well. They have all the resources okay. there. And if they're, if they're, let's say they're in Texas, they have resources about how to get to the miscarriage and abortion hotline and repro legal health care and repro legal health line and all of that. It's a one-stop shopping. And by the way, they created a chat box, chat bot called Charlie. I did an article about it. If you Google, like, my name is magazine and Charlie, you'll find it. It's great because like on your phone, it just takes you through all the options. And you, you know, you say, I want to do in person or I want you say where you all you have to say is where you are and how far along you are. And it will work you through all your options. It's very secure, digitally sophisticated, and helpful. So I guess actually I'd just say send them to Charlie. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. Any other questions? Andrew, my cousin. <laughs> Yeah. And it struck me, I'm curious what your thoughts are on it, but the, the 73 to 90, whatever it is, um, peak of that graph roughly corresponds to the childbearing years of baby boom women, doesn't it? Oh, interesting. And then you have to you know, another smaller generation. No, I, well, maybe, maybe. But the reason there's a drop in the early 90s, anybody remember what happened in 1992? Casey versus Planned Parenthood, where the court gutted Roe. You know, we all talk about Roe was reversed. It wasn't Roe, it was Casey. And Casey had already half gutted Roe. It allowed states to be able to put all sorts of restrictions on abortion, like waiting periods, um, you know, ult unnecessary ultrasounds. You know, abortion clinics have to have hallways that are yay wide, even though it's not necessary. They need ambulatory, you know, all these restrictions that made it more expensive, harder to get. And that's that was the beginning of the end. The other big dip is when Obama got into office and the antis began to use abortion to try to um, uh, gut uh, the support of black people for Obama, but also just democratic support. It became a real political issue. So the sort of two drops are connected to those two periods. And then it got all the way down and then starts to go up. So I, I think it may be that it was connected to like number of people or baby boom. But um, And by the way, this was only abortions in the formal medical system. Abortions have always happened outside. For instance, people that immigrate to the United States that don't have health care, you know, because of course, Medi Medicaid doesn't, Medicare doesn't cover um, immigrant women. Um, they always had alternative ways of getting abortion pills, flea markets, networks. And, and now we're drawing on a lot of that knowledge. I, I trace that in my book. Um, you know, it was women in Brazil that figured out that misoprostol alone can work. And it's because they looked, it was over the counter, it's ulcer medication, over the counter, they looked at it and said, don't use, if you're pregnant, may cause miscarriage. And the government of Brazil noticed that maternal mortality from abortion was plummeting. And so they started researching it and they figured out what the women were doing. And then of course immediately pulled the drug from the market. You know, because they wanted dead women more than women getting abortion and being safe. And, but in the meantime, in 1990 in Argentina, women from across Latin America held a big conference and shared the information. And so across the world, death rates from illegal abortion have, have gone down a lot since the discovery of misoprostol. And misoprostol, unlike MIFI, is very cheap. I mean, if you get it for your ulcer, you know, it's very cheap. They're pennies a pill. And so, um, you know, that's always there and it's always widely available. So, yeah. So maybe uh, one more question. One more question. Yeah, John Conley, former provost. <laughs> you know, in the oral arguments on the 26th of March, um, both Thomas and Alito seemed very enthusiastic about doing that. And Project 2025, which if you don't know what it is, you should find out. It's the Heritage Foundation's 897-page policy agenda, of which I've read a lot. Uh, it's a written by a coalition of over 100 right-wing organizations, and it is what they want the next Republican president to do. And they mention the Comstock Act, and they say, we don't need to ban abortion. It's already banned. We just need a Republican president who will enforce that. And that's, I'm sure, what Trump will do if he gets in office, is he'll say, well, oh, I'm just following the law. And, you know, Dems have tried to introduce legislation to reverse the Comstock Act, and the Republicans have blocked it. And so um, I think it's an incorrect interpretation of the Comstock Act to say that it bans abortion. It's never, even back then, it was not meant that. And um, Mary Ziegler, she's a law professor at, where is she now? I can't remember. But she's written a lot on this and done like an in-depth dive. And actually, the Department of Justice, I did a story on this. The Department of, so after Dobbs, and this is, I promise I'll finish soon. After Dobbs, the USPS asked the Justice Department to give a legal opinion about whether mailing abortion pills violated Comstock. And the Department of Justice, and granted it's Biden's Department of Justice, issued a legal opinion that I think is really solid saying, no, it does not. 
and, uh, and that it was only ever meant to prohibit illegal mailing, uh, mailing of abortifacients for um, unlawful purposes. But you know, when a doc in Massachusetts is mailing pills, that's not unlawful in Massachusetts. It's legal, right? So, um, but of course, the Yantes don't agree with that, and the Republicans, you know, they want us. They're the way that Mary Ziegler says it is they're reinventing the Comstock Act as a 21st century abortion ban, even though that's why it never, it was never meant to be that. Yeah, I know the zombie law phenomenon. Um, but Arizona's going to have a ballot initiative, and so is Florida. And this is good because they're both swing states, and they will turn out the voters. And this is one issue that is bipartisan, not among lawmakers, but among the people. I mean, 59% of people in Kentucky voted pro-choice. 57% uh, of people in Ohio voted pro-choice on ballot measures. There have been seven ballot measures since Dobbs. Every one of them has gone pro-choice, even in red states. And um, there are already, there's been like three that have been, they've gotten enough signatures, um, but there could be up to 12. And many of them are in these battleground states. So I think it's gonna be a major um, tool for the Dems to, to keep that White House, to get the House, and hopefully keep the Senate as well. In addition to getting state, you know, so anyway, I'm down into the politics, so don't go, let me go there. But um, I just want to, I mean, it's so meaningful to me to see this room full and to see so many faces, family, students, colleagues, my, my elementary school best friend, <laughs> mother of a smithy, yay, and, um, you know, uh, just so many uh, long-term friends, um, new friends, colleagues, so, so I just want to um, thank everybody for being here today.